Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can all hear me. And welcome to this first Global Energy Systems Conference. My name is Ewan Mearns, and I'm a member of the organizing committee. And I'll tell you in a moment why it has fallen on me to make this opening address. The main concept of this conference is depicted in our logo. We wanted to bring together globally renowned experts from fossil fuel, nuclear, and renewable energy industries with academia and government in order to initiate an objective debate about the best future course for our global energy system. This is a massive task. There are many entrenched views and opinions about energy, often not rooted in engineering, economic, or societal reality. The pie chart shows the rough, rough distribution of delegates, about half from academia, somewhat over a quarter from industry, and the remainder from government and government institutions. We have achieved one of our initial goals. I'm delighted to say that we have delegates from 25 different countries spanning five continents. May I welcome you all to Edinburgh, the capital city of Scotland, and hope that you find this to be a delightful city. Some 13 months ago, when I was at a conference in Vienna, Professor Shell Alaclet, who is with us here today, who heads up the Global Energy Systems Research Group at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, asked if I, together with others, would arrange a conference on energy in Scotland. Knowing what an enormous task this would be, I agreed somewhat reluctantly and on condition that it would be an energy conference with a difference. Having laid the early groundwork, I passed on the reins of organization to the three gentlemen who are sitting to my right today, Rembrandt Coppolar, Roger Bentley, or to the far right, and Yalta Harnmeyer in the middle. I personally want to thank these three for relieving me of the substantial burden, and I want to pay tribute to the huge amount of work they have put in to arranging this amazing conference. It has been a great team effort. I also wish to acknowledge the valuable assistance from Chris Vernon, Simon Ratcliffe, Richard Miller, and B.J. Bhopal. Rembrandt, Roger, and Yalta will be facilitating the proceedings in each day as shown on the slide. Rembrandt for the remainder of today, Roger tomorrow, and Yalta on Friday. And so I suggest that the speakers make themselves known to the facilitator in advance, and if you have any queries, they are there to answer your questions. Conferences cost money to run. So I wish to express gratitude on behalf of all of the organizing committee to our main sponsors. The University of Aberdeen, my alma mater, and the University of Edinburgh are the main conference sponsors. The University of Bristol and Uppsala also made valued contributions. New Era, representing the Herald Group of Newspapers, and SEEN, the Sustainable Community Energy Network, have provided sponsorship in kind. It is worth noting that we have no industry or government sponsors. This is not for want of trying. So why do we see the need for a Global Energy Systems Conference at this time? I'm sure everyone in this room will be aware of the rise in oil and energy prices over the past decade, as tight supplies collided with rampant demand from East Asia. Equally, everyone will be aware of concern about the impact of emissions on climate change. We found ourselves on the doorstep of a new energy transition that may see declining dependency on fossil fuels and increasing dependency on alternative energy supplies. But which ones? The history of naval warfare provides some insight to the history of energy, energy transition over the last millennium. A thousand years ago, the Viking superpower possessed the mighty longship, powered by wind and manpower. They explored a quarter of the northern hemisphere in these splendid craft. Man-powered vessels gave way to larger sailing ships that enabled man to circumnavigate the globe and to build empires. These, in turn, gave way to cold-fired steamships as man's mind turned to metal during the Industrial Revolution of Europe and North America that took place during the 19th century. Coal gave way to oil that offered even more power and, ultimately, offered even more power, and ultimately, naval capital ships are now driven by nuclear power. Rowing boats, sailing ships, all fired ships, and nuclear-powered 
ships are all still operational today. A feature of past energy transition is that new sources are added to the existing. Never did society contemplate wholesale replacement of one source with another. The simple picture of naval history also bears one further lesson. Technology and innovation was driven by a desire to gain tactical advantage. The new technologies and designs that were adopted offered clear superiority over what went before. There was no master plan, no blueprint. Nations that had developed and adopted the winning formula won battles. What chance would the Mary Rose, this is the Mary, oh, didn't mean to do that. The Mary Rose, this is Henry VIII's flagship, have against the USS Nimitz. I can hear the wind enthusiasts in the audience complaining this is not a fair comparison. And true, today's wind technology bears little resemblance to that from the 16th century. And of course, nuclear power carries a small amount of extraordinary high impact risk. There is still a 50 mile exclusion zone around Fukushima Daiichi today. The nearest nuclear power plant, plant to dynamic earth is at Torness, 30 miles east of here. I hope this may frame the difficult nature of some of the choices we are trying to make. Choices. Yeah. Human society finds itself at a unique juncture where billions have information at their fingertips. For the first time, human society finds itself trying to plan an energy transition based on thousands of opinions and imperfect data. <laughs> This conference aims to provide a foundation upon which to build sensible energy strategies. Continuing with the theme of naval warfare, a landmark event for the UK and the world as a whole was a decision made by Winston Churchill in 1911 to convert the Royal Navy from coal to oil-fired steam power. Oil offered clear tactical advantages over longer range, greater, offering longer range, greater speed and because it was a free-loading liquid fuel, less manpower on board naval vessels. But the UK had one problem. We had a large amount of coal, but no oil that we knew of then. This set the stage for dependency upon foreign imported sources of energy. But it wasn't seen as a problem then since oil was cheap and we would have the most powerful and maneuverable navy in the world to secure supplies from the Middle East. I wonder what choice Winston Churchill would make today. The chart shows the history of UK primary energy production. Perhaps you can't read the scale, but in grey here is the history of UK coal production from 1830 to 2010, with a peak in UK coal production roughly in 1911. The rise of coal mining during the Industrial Revolution and falls subsequent to Churchill's 1911 decision. Did coal production in the UK fall due to falling demand, competition from cheap surface mined imports, or were our good quality reserves simply exhausted? That's a question I've asked many times and have yet to hear a well-informed response to. Virtually every European country is dependent upon energy imports, and this lies at the heart of trade imbalances and trauma in the finance system. A solution has to be found. And so to a quick look at the conference programme, over three days we have chosen three highly topical themes. On day one today, we are looking at the future of fossil fuels. On day two, that's tomorrow, we will be examining the future of the electricity system. And on Friday, the economics and policy of energy systems. At this point, I wish to draw attention to the posters that are displayed upstairs in the ozone where refreshments will be served. So a very brief overview of today's talks. We have what I regard as a mouth-watering program of presentations from true international experts in their fields. Now, you can read about this in your brochure, so I'm not going to dwell on this in detail. But I would like to say that I'm particularly pleased to see that we have talks on the future of Chinese coal production and on Rus Russian natural gas supplies. These are two extremely large and important sources of energy. China's industrial revolution, economic growth, has grown in lockstep with coal production in a way not dissimilar to the UK 150 years ago. 
A halt in the growth of Chinese coal production has potential to send a ripple around the world. And Europe is heavily dependent upon gas imports from Russia. How long can Russia keep supplying? And for how long can Europe keep paying? This is my penultimate slide. It shows the tale of oil production on two continents. There's North America here and here, and Europe to the right. Growing production in North America and falling production in Europe. The North American chart to the left shows the growing wedge of unconventional oil from shale and from tar sands. And this has made a significant contribution to the growth in oil supply on that continent. Will it be possible for Europe to emulate this success with unconventional sources of fossil fuels? I imagine some might be asking, is it desirable for Europe to emulate this success? I personally doubt it, but hopefully we're going to learn more about the future, future prospects of unconventional oil and gas supplies later today. The contrasting fortunes here are down to a number of factors. One of the more important is that most of Europe's oil is in offshore mature basins. There are energy policy issues in play. I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone in Brussels say, drill, baby, drill. There are energy security issues with Europe increasingly dependent upon Russia, Africa, and the Middle East for oil and gas. And as already mentioned, there are economic issues with vast capital flows into the exporting nations with equivalent flows leaving the importing nations. So the time has come to introduce Lord John Oxborough, who's <coughs> sitting at the front here, our first keynote speaker to present his lecture on global energy challenges. Lord Oxborough has a long and remarkable career that began in Oxford and Princeton, where he worked on the emerging theory of plate tectonics. He has been head of earth science at Cambridge and visiting professor at Stanford, Caltech and Cornell. He spent five years advising the UK Ministry of Defence. I'd be intrigued to know what advice and propulsion, propulsion systems he may have offered. He spent two years as chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, was knighted in 1992, and was made a life peer in 1999. I'm delighted that you've joined us today, and as I hand over the floor to Lord Oxborough, I ask that you all welcome him in the customary way. <laughs> 